Thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the CSGF for their support over the last four years. Today I'm going to be telling you about a novel method for understanding the effects of genetic variation on DNA methylation. Now, some of the terminology in this title may be unfamiliar to you, but I will explain it as I go along. I'm going to begin by giving you some background in the biology to motivate the problem we worked on. I will then present our novel methods, and finally, I will show you our preliminary results for some biological background. Before I go into the details of the project, I need to tell you a little bit about molecular biology. So every cell in your body has identical DNA, and this DNA consists of four bases, A, T, G, and C. Within DNA, there are regions called genes. These regions are used as a template for creating RNA in a process that's called transcription. RNA is then used as a template to make proteins, which do most of the processes in your cell. My passion lies in understanding how transcription happens. Now, you may wonder why transcription is important. So there have been many bases of DNA that have been shown to be associated with disease, and you might think that most of them are found within genes, but actually most of them are found in regions outside of genes, which suggests that the way that they affect disease is through transcriptional regulation. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about DNA methylation, which is something that can affect transcription. As I mentioned, one of the bases of DNA is C. Now, Cs can be by themselves, or they can be modified to be methylated, which means they have a methyl group attached. A methyl group is just a carbon surrounded by three hydrogens. Now, for the purposes of this talk, we are going to abbreviate a methylated C as CME. Cs that are not methylated can be followed by any base of DNA where Cs that are methylated are almost always followed by Gs. A C followed by a G is abbreviated as a CPG, and for the remainder of this talk, when I discuss methylation, I will be referring to CPGs. Most CPGs are found near other CPGs in the genome in regions that are called CPG islands. Because of this, most studies of DNA methylation have focused almost exclusively on CPG islands. Our study, however, as I will show you, is able to look at CPGs that are outside of CPG islands, and as I will explain, this can be extremely important. So how does methylation affect transcription? Well, there are many ways it can, and some of them we don't even know. If we have many methylated Cs that are near the beginning of the gene, transcription does not happen. Well, this is usually true. There are a few counterexamples in the literature. If we have many methylated Cs within a gene, transcription does happen. Well, this is often true. There are some counterexamples of this in the literature as well. Finally, if we have many methylated Cs in a region of DNA that is not near a gene, but is known to be involved in regulating a gene, transcription does not happen. However, there are only a few examples of this because most studies of DNA methylation have focused almost exclusively on Cs that are near or in genes. Our study, however, as I will show you, is able to look throughout the genome. So I'm now going to explain the concept of methylation quantitative trait loci, which our study focuses on. And the reason we're interested in them is that they can dramatically affect transcription. We abbreviate methylation quantitative trait loci as MQTLs. So what are MQTLs? MQTLs are when we have a base of DNA that is strongly correlated when, with whether or not a C is methylated in individuals. To give you some biology terminology, a base of DNA that varies across individuals is called a single nucleotide polymorphism, which is abbreviated as SNP. And the version of the base that an individual has is called the allele. We are going to call whether or not a C is methylated in an individual the methylation status of the C. Now, I also need to introduce the concept of heterozygosity. So every piece of DNA in your cell actually has two copies one from your mother, and one from your father. And while there's variation in a base across individuals, there can also be variation with, across the two copies of DNA within a single individual. So which allele you may have can vary, and also whether the methylation status of a C can vary. This concept is extremely important, and many studies of DNA methylation have not actually accounted for heterozygosity. Our study will be able to do that. The goal of our study is to answer the following question. Which differences 
and DNA bases are associated with whether or not nearby Cs are methylated. In more formal terminology, which SNPs are MQTLs? Once we have answered this question, we can then investigate the following follow-up question. Do these associations provide mechanisms that explain how SNPs may affect transcription or disease? M many SNPs have been shown to be associated with transcription and disease, but the mechanism through which these SNPs influence transcription or disease is not known. Because affecting methylation can directly affect transcription, finding that a SNP associated with transcription is also associated with methylation provides a potential mechanism through which that SNP influences transcription. Now that I've given you some background, I'm going to describe our novel method for finding MQTLs. So I need to first tell you about the way that we figure out whether or not Cs are methylated. The most popular way of doing this is called methylation arrays. So the way methylation arrays work is we pick a subset of Cs in the genome that we are interested in, and we probe whether or not these Cs are methylated. When we're doing this, we take an average across the cells in our study. So if we take a bunch of cells from an individual and the Cs vary between the two copies from the two parents, we will be taking an average of that. We can also do this for finding alleles of SNPs. The other popular method is called whole genome bisulfite sequencing. So before I go into exactly how this works, I need to tell you a little bit about general DNA sequencing. So the way it works is you chop DNA in your cell up into small pieces, and you put it through the sequencer, and then the sequencer tells you what each base is. And when you do bisulfite sequencing, it can also tell you whether the Cs are methylated. As a result, we can look at every single C in the genome and find out whether it is methylated. In addition, because we're looking at pieces of DNA from your cell separately, we can separately look at DNA from your mother and from your father. We can, in addition, because we're looking at every base of DNA, we can do the same thing for SNPs. We can figure out what allele of the SNP you have, and we can look separately for your mother and from your father. So let us now go back to our example of a heterozygous individual. So in this example, let's say we're going to have some kind of indicator variable for our SNP that is a 1 if we have the T allele and a 0 if you have the A allele. And let's say we're also going to have an indicator that's a 1 if you're methylated and a 0 if you're unmethylated. If we use the methylation array, we're going to be averaging across the two copies. So for our allele, we'll get a 0.5, and for our methylation status, we will also get a 0.5. However, if we do bisulfite sequencing, we can look at the two copies of DNA separately. So for the copy from the mother, for the allele, we get a 1 because we have the T allele. And for the methylation status, we also get a 1 because our C is methylated. For the copy from the father, for the allele, we get a 0 because we do not have the C allele. And for the methylation status, we also get a 0. Thus, the bisulfite sequencing is able to give us a much finer resolution in addition to, be able to being able to look at every base in the genome. So you may be wondering, if bisulfite sequencing is so much better, why isn't everybody doing bisulfite sequencing? The fact of the matter is, bisulfite sequencing is extremely expensive. In fact, it is so expensive that it is currently not feasible to do bisulfite sequencing on cells for more than a few individuals. What we wanted to do is to be able to do bisulfite sequencing on more than a few individuals. However, we want to be able to do this cheaply. So in an ideal world, we would separately take a large number of cells from each of our individuals of interest, and we do bisulfite sequencing separately on the large number of cells from each individual. Instead, what we did is we took a small number of cells from each individual, and we put them into a pool of cells, and then did bisulfite sequencing just on this pool that contained a mixture of cells from the different individuals. Thus, we were able to do bisulfite sequencing for, on cells from all of these individuals for a much lower cost. To tell you a little bit more about the cells that we chose, we used a cell type called lymphoblastoid cell lines, abbreviated LCLs, which is one of the most commonly studied cell lines in humans. Because of this, we are able to later integrate other information we know about LCLs with our results. In addition, we did the study on 60 Arubans from Nigeria that have been used in many other studies. As a result of this, we can integrate other information we have learned about these individuals with our results. So now you may be wondering, if we are doing this study on a pool of cells, how do we get MQTLs? So the way we do it is, as I mentioned, we, when we sequence, we have all of these reads, which are these pieces of DNA. Now if a SNF is near a C, we can, on a single read, see what version of the SNF we have and whether or not the C is methylated. 
we can then count up the different combinations we have of alleles and methylation statuses and use Fisher's exact test to evaluate the significance of the association. Now, this may seem very simple to you, but in our data set, we have hundreds of millions of reads. And we um, also have many SNP CPG pairs that we want to test the associations for. If we were just running this in serial on a single processor, this would take a long time. So we ran this in parallel over thousands of processors and were able to get these associations quickly. Now that I have shown you our methods, I'm going to present our preliminary results. So first I should tell you that we evaluated over 740,000 CPGs. Just to give you a basis for comparison, most array studies look at about 27,000 CPGs, and there have recently been a few larger array studies that looked at about 450,000. We are still evaluating a few hundred thousand more CPGs than the largest array studies. From this, we were able to get a couple thousand MQTLs. So, and some of these MQTLs overlap with SNPs that have already been associated with transcription. And the studies that looked at SNPs and transcription was actually done on many of the same individuals in our study, which suggests that the overlap might be meaningful. In addition, some of these SNPs are SNPs that have been previously shown to be associated with physical traits. So four of these SNPs are SNPs that have previously been shown to be associated with diseases. And there are two of these SNPs we thought were particularly interesting. One is a SNP that has been shown to be associated with age-related macular degeneration in multiple studies, and the other is a SNP that has been shown to be associated with the ratio of visceral adipose tissue to subcutaneous adipose tissue, which is a measure of obesity. N I should say that neither of these SNPs were found to be in QTLs in previous studies, and the reason for that is that these SNPs are in CPGs that do not occur near other CPGs, but occur on their own, which means that previous studies did not even look at them. In order to show that these MQTLs are real and not just some kind of artifact of bisulfite sequencing, we validated them using a method called pyrosequencing, which is thought to be a better but also much more expensive method for assaying methylation. So first, let me show you our bisulfite sequencing results. So for the first MQTL, which is the one that's associated with macular degeneration, Individuals with the A allele, the allele associated with macular generation, generally have an unmethylated CPG nearby, where those with the C allele, which is not associated with macular generation, have the CPG nearby being methylated. This suggests that lack of methylation in this CPG is associated with macular degeneration. For our other MQTL, the one associated with obesity, Individuals with the G allele, the allele that is associated with obesity, have a CPG nearby that is usually methylated. Where for reads with the C allele, the one not associated with obesity, the CPG nearby is not methylated. This suggests that the methylation of the CPG, in this case, is associated with obesity. As you can see in the charts below, the pyrosequencing validation almost perfectly matches our bisulfite sequencing results. So the light blue bars are displaying the same thing as the light blue bars here on the top plot, and the center bars are for heterozygous individuals. This suggests that these MQTLs that we found that are associated with disease and were not found in other studies are real and not just some kind of artifact of our experiment. So to summarize our contributions, we provide a novel methods for pooling and association in, for identifying MQTLs. We use these methods to identify over 2,000 MQTLs, most of which were not able to be found in previous studies. And finally, we found some MQTLs that are associated with transcription and with disease, which suggests possible mechanisms through which these SNPs influence transcription and disease. I would like to thank my advisor, Hunter Frazier, my co-advisor, Antro Kundaje, our experimentalists who generated this data, Michael Kobor, Sarah Ma, and Julie McIsaac from the University of British Columbia, and Yishi Zhao from the Frazier Lab, the labs I have been in while working on this project, the Frazier, Kohler, and Kundaje Labs, and last but not least, the DOE Computational Science Graduate Fellowship for funding me over the last four years and giving me many wonderful opportunities. I'll take questions.